uh, good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to tonight's webinar uh, entitled Not All That Grittles Is Gold. Uh, this is the third uh, webinar organized by, by the Upper Egypt uh, Assisted Production uh, uh, Society. As you know, this is a very active society uh, in our part of the world, but uh, its webinars are uh, um, uh, meant to be for everybody across the globe. Now, it is my great pleasure uh, to be the moderator today. We have, want to start by welcoming two eminent speakers, world-class speakers, Professor Yaqub Khalaf and Professor Khalid Khan. And uh, of course, we have always been asking ourselves, uh, what is the difference between uh, the different studies we read? What, are the, what do they mean by odd ratio? Uh, relative risk, rate of difference, sample size, and so on how to read the paper in the women's health, how to draw evidence from the paper, how to grade this evidence, what do they mean by area under the curve and what is a meta-analysis and so on. And, to, and tonight, I'm very pleased to have with us two world authorities I just said. Professor Yakub Khalaf, who you probably know, is Professor of Reductive Medicine and Surgery at Guy's St. Thomas's and King's College Hospital, my alma mater. He's Head of Fertility Services and Director of Assisted Conception Unit and he's also the head of the Center of Pre-Implantation Genetic Diagnosis at Guy's and St. Thomas's, the largest in the UK. He's a board member of the um, Human Fertility and Embryology Authority of the UK, which oversees all IVF activities in the United Kingdom. And in this authority, he's also chair of the Scientific and Clinical Advances Advisory Committee uh, in HIFIA, as I said. He's a member and the board of the board of directors uh, of the International Society of IVF. He's the deputy director of the specialty training program in reproductive medicine and surgery and at uh, Guy's and St. Thomas's. He has many other titles just to show a little. If we go on, we will not finish. Professor Yaqub Khalas, who will be with us tonight uh, with his great experience and his vast knowledge, as well as Professor Khalid Khan. Professor Khalid Khan is also a world authority on the subject. He's Professor of Women's Health and Clinical Epidemiology and a distinguished investigator at the University of Granada in Spain, Gornata, and Queen Mary University of London. He's the editor-in-chief of the British Journal of Setting and Gynecology. He published a vast number of papers, giving him a huge ed index of more than 70. He's a lead author of the book, Systematic Reviews to Support Evidence-Based Medicine, which won a BMA Medical Book Award. He's the editor of the Evidence-Based Medicine British Medical Journal and also of Biomed Central Medical Education. And his editorial initiative called Crown, Crown Core Outcomes in Women's and Newborn Health won him also a BMA Strat and Harper's Award. And again, I can go on and on, uh, but uh, for the sake of time. Uh, we are very pleased to have these two eminent world-class leaders to, uh, with us to, uh, tonight. And uh, uh, before forgetting, I would like to ask you to post your questions and answers uh, to you, your question on the Q and A section uh, and not on the chat uh, section. And please start by putting them from now. Don't wait until the end of the webinar. Uh, put them as far as you uh, uh, want to ask them. And with this, I hand my camera and my audio to Professor Yaqub Khalaf, who is going to be the first speaker. Professor Khalaf. <music>
Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. It is a great pleasure to be with you tonight. I would like to thank Professor Salam for his generous and um, over uh, enthusiastic introduction. And I also like to welcome my friend, Professor Khaled Khan for being with us. It's a real pleasure to be uh, uh, with Khaled. He is a real authority. And I just would like to start by a disclaimer. One, that the title and the idea of this webinar is nothing to do with me. And it comes from Mohammed Fauzi and his group because they are always finger on the pulse of what the overall uh, um, group of colleagues would be interested to hear. I wouldn't take any credit also for the content of what I talk because I decided to share with you how I approach my evidence-based practice. If I have a clinical query, how do I go about answering it? When I look at a paper, what are my views and thoughts? And they could be right, they could be wrong, but we have Khaled to put us right at the end. So, and you're right if thinking it's all about evidence-based medicine and evidence-based practice. And one definition of evidence-based medicine is the integration of the pathophysiological mechanisms and the outcome of top quality clinical research. And that is academic, but the same person who defined the academic definition, he gave us a practical one which has guided us to think of evidence-based medicine as having three pillars. The first pillar will be made of the um, best research evidence, coupled with clinical expertise, and at the heart of it is patient values, because what is good and evidence-based intervention in one setting where patient, where patient values accept may not be the same in another setting where it is no, no for patient values on religious, ethical, ethnic, whatever background. We owe a lot of what we enjoy in terms of the concept of evidence medicine to Archie Cochrane, who was a chess physician around the second world war. And he really was at pain to invest in evidence-based medicine, or at least to find it, because it didn't exist, I think, at this point in time. And this is one of his account in his very uh, well-cited book uh, at the end here of the slide. He was treating his colleagues from tuberculosis. And he, according to him, he said, I had considerable freedom of clinical choice of therapy. My trouble was that I didn't know which to use and when. I would gladly have sacrificed my freedom for a little knowledge. Just how genuine and how pioneering in his thoughts the guy was. I had never heard then of randomized controlled trials, but I knew there was no real evidence that anything we had to offer had any effect on tuberculosis. And here is the nub of the story. The patients that happened to be his friends, were his main concern because he said, I was afraid that I shortened the lives of some of my friends by unnecessary intervention. It was true then, and it is true to some extent now. Even luckily, what we deal with is not a matter of life and death. You could argue it is far more important than that. So this just sets the scene for how do we distinct make a distinction between our observations and our assessment of interventions. It is true that when we make observation, we see something happening, but we don't learn other than from studying intervention. Then it will teach us what works and what doesn't. So if evidence is our quest, if evidence is our concern, how to go about it? If I wanted to answer a clinical query, I will start according to this well-founded framework by asking the question. And you might think it is the easiest things in the world. And unfortunately in real life, that is not true because most clinical questions don't get answered. And most of the time, because the clinician does not pursue an answer. 
I can assure you, if you wanted to answer the question, am I doing my patient a favor by giving them ICSI when the sperm is absolutely fine? You will find the answer, but you're not willing to pursue it because you're already doing as the Romans do. You found people doing it, let's do it. And you justify it. But if you answer and follow that scheme, you will come up with a different clinical answer. How to acquire the knowledge to help us answer that clinical question? This used to be the method. You have to find a very accomplished library to go and really have your eyes strained, your brain strained, and get confused and get squint in the process because you will be looking at all the articles in the big um, reviews and have to make friendship with the librarians and be nice so that they can allow you a little bit of rummaging through the books. We are privileged now because if we wanted to look at the evidence, we have very good and well-established and readily available sources. You can start by going to guidelines what the national guidelines in a decent society would say. If you have the guidelines summarizing the evidence and giving you the bottom line, the job is done for you. No excuse for avoiding it. One word of caution about guidelines, not every bit of guidelines is suitable for every setting. Hence, the need to adapt the guidelines sometimes before adopting them into any particular setting. It's important to also exercise your own appraisal of those guidelines before adapting or adopting. I'll give you an example. The European Guidelines for Management of Recurrent Miscarriage. When you read them, it comes to an investigation like DNA fragmentation. It, 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 it tries next to it exploratory. What does this mean for goodness sake? What does it mean exploratory? This is in a research setting. This is a clinical setting where people need to be told what adds value and what doesn't. It doesn't help the patient in the slightest bit of saying, therefore, guidelines need to be also critically approached, but reasonably so, not to go all guns blazing to destroy them. You look for reviews. If there are reviews exist, preferably systematic review as we will hear all about them from Khaled later and is there are primary studies, when there is friction between systematic reviews and primary studies, how we can make a judgment. And then we appraise and ad adapt and adopt the evidence. So having done so, currently we are even further fortunate. I just decided two minutes ago, you might see the time when I did that search. I put in vitro fertilization and I ticked on the side randomized control trials just by one keyword, 1925 randomized control trial. And by absolute chance, the first two trials that appears, I seem to be a co-author on both of them. And, and also by chance, one of them published in Reproductive Health and one in New England Journal of Medicine. So you can find access and you can get good evidence-based ground by just asking the question and going about it, not to the library, not spending ages, but having it on a plate. All you need to be is to be a discerning reader. And we are fully aware of the hierarchy of evidence. We have systematic reviews at the top. We have randomized control trial. And at the end, to the disappoint of our uh, expert colleagues, expert opinion that are put into context, they are not at the top. Case series and this patient got pregnant by having polument do not count, unless if those case series were really enough to generate hypothesis and to take them further. So how to read a paper? Just that is a very common question. When we read a paper, shall we just jump down to the conclusion at the bottom page page which is says this works and doesn't without reading and without digging deeper into the paper. This is how it is being proposed. There are acronym called PP icons. And the first PP will be to look at the problem. Is it a problem I see in my practice? If it's not, you are really going theoretical and patients will not benefit. The patient population, does this study patient population look like my patient population? I give you an idea. 
sometimes you find studies that looked at patients who have high ovarian reserve. When all you are seeing are the previous failure and the one with very reduced ovarian reserve, it may not apply. Patients with high BMI in your setting, where this is study was conducted on hand-picked patients with their BMI 20, 21. Patient population, does the study patient population look my patient? That is exactly the point that one need to look at. Then I for intervention. What is the intervention and is it realistic in my setting? If people are studying egg donation, again, it's something else. It, you, you lose interest all of a sudden because egg donation is not accepted in your society and you'll have to struggle with management of poor responders a little bit further. Comparison. What is the intervention being compared to? And is it a reasonable comparison? Because sometimes people will indulge and insidiously compare apples and oranges, and then any conclusion will be invalid. Outcomes. Would the outcome matter to my patient? And I use this opportunity for infertility studies, whether it is a cis-conception or spontaneous fertility. If you ask any patient, what matters to you most will tell you having a baby but the number of eggs is not a great outcome. Fertilization rate, no matter how important it is, is not a great outcome. Implantation rate is not a great outcome. I don't have the time to go why implantation rate should not be used as an outcome. And the best you can do is clinical or ongoing or better is live births. And in this day and age, it should be cumulative live births as well. Number, how many times you see trials that studied 22 patients. I give you an example of the study about using antioxidant for female infertility. Does you re do you really get anything meaningful from 22 patients? So there is no kidding here. It is important to take this all into consideration. Now, when you add all these studies and try to perform a, an objective systematic review, this paper published by Khaled and his group back in 2003, giving us a framework and outline for the most objective uh, systematic review that need to have the question, I go back to this, framed appropriately from the beginning, that the relevant work has been identified, that the quality of the study has been assessed, that the summarizing of the evidence requires special expertise and interpreting the findings will require a lot of expertise, a lot of um, impartiality, and lack of commercial or intellectual prejudice. So we talk about meta-analysis. I'm not, I'm just scratching the surface, but you will hear more in depth later. We know that statistic, uh, meta-analysis, the statistical analysis that pulls the results of independent clinical trial considered to be combinable, because if they are not, that is just not leading to anything aiming to attain an estimate of average effect size attributable to certain intervention. Unfortunately, we see meta-analysis where prospective is, is um, mixed with retrospective and it is a soup or a salad more than a meta-analysis. The quality of the individual studies is important um, and you can judge the quality by the methodological strengths of the relevant study. If it's alternate day randomization, I think a lot has been lost. If there is no allocation concealment, you might as well say non-randomized in some ex to some extent. And how able it is, the study, through its design and its conduct to prevent systematic error or bias. And pulling the result from low level evidence, if they are retrospective with those from perspective, you will really get lost and evidence will be lost too. And we are all familiar when people do systematic reviews, whether they are Cochrane or otherwise, they will always try to look at the areas that matters, whether it is random sequence, allocation concealment was one of the most important feature, blinding. And when you find the question mark about those major um, um, tenets of getting good evidence, you need to seize it, see them in perspective and not take it just by the title. And this is the sad truth whether it is randomized controlled trial, whether it is systematic review, whether it is meta-analysis or one or both. Unfortunately, we have to be discerning and we have to be critical and we are not expected to believe everything we read because some people will take the word 
that there is increase in, or the p-value is this and they go wild. But if they look at the heterogeneity of this meta-analysis, they will understand probably it is potentially misleading. Back to the hierarchy, it is a lot of stuff here about randomized control trial following um, systematic review. And it is for us to do the appraisal, as I said, and we have to always adopt a critical thinking of literature regardless of the title and use very discerning eyes to look at this. So that's what goes through my mind when I am appraising the literature beyond the standard that I mentioned. First and foremost, the study design. If the investigator decide which exposure that the patient will have, this is interventional or experimental. And there is no way other than randomization. If there is randomization, then it is randomized control trial. If it's not randomized, this is mostly observational and does not really add much because bias will be palpable. If the investigator does not decide the exposure, it is observational. And the observation study, you will be comparing two groups, yes or no, and then it can be either analytical or descriptive. descriptive. So that design is important. The other thing is about collaboration. Whenever you find a study where it is multi-center, particularly they are reputable centers and they have track record, this has a lot of credibility than having a single center study. And that is being acknowledged by the BMJ in a paper in 2012, and there are plenty of paper, impact of single center status on estimates of intervention effect in trials with continuous outcome, meta-epidemiological study. The bottom line of the study suggests that single center study will always have the tendency to exaggerate the effect of the intervention compared with multi-center studies. And that should not surprise anyone. If we have a conflict between large multi-center randomized control trial and the meta-analysis, which one to go with? And that is an important subject that I hope Khaled will um, clarify for us. Resolving discrepancies when findings from randomized control trials and meta-analysis disagree. And it's amazing. It just really faces us in day-to-day -day activity. We're having a meeting at the Scientific and Clinical Advances Advisory Committee of the HFA on the 19th of this month. And we are facing just this issue. And as much as you would like to be objective and give a fair hearing to systematic analysis of the literature, you know that some of the component of those systematic reviews is beyond um, trust. It, they, they are flawed. But because people who do this systematic review with a Scocker review, they assume honesty. They assume integrity. They assume that the work is done. And unfortunately, that sometimes can derail our effort to try with, to get a meaningful evidence for patient to follow. Reputation impact and impact factor, whether it's the reputation of the investigator, the reputation of the journal that is being published, and the impact factor of the author and the impact factor of the journal. All these are important in how you view the paper. Just looking at the conclusion without seeing which journal is published in, whether it is in the outskirts of this country, where, where it is in a big publishing organization with long track record with its Lancet, New England Journal of Medicine, American Journal of Ops and Gyne, and British Journal of Ops and Gyne, or some. And we need to be aware that there is a, a phenomenon called the predator publishing. The predator publishing or the journals, and all of you will have in your inbox invitation to be on the editorial board of this journal or the other journal. It is an explosion. Unfortunately, that should be welcome if it is doing a good job, but it's not because it's accepting the good, the bad, and the ugly. So that integrity index is not negotiable. That goes for investigator and goes for the investigations, how it is being done and the publication that results from it. And it is a culture issue. It is a belief issue because here is how medical students are taught this when they are undergraduate. What can you do to ensure compliance? Practice and model values for academic integrity. Honesty, trust, fairness, respect, and responsibility. Take careful note and document your source and data. 
Give yourself sufficient time to complete assignment. Trust yourself. Your ideas are expressed in your own words. It doesn't have to be copied from another paper. Consider the value of learning for its own sake and consider the consequences. That framework is enshrined into the medical curriculum, then it does not become alien when people are put under pressure. So research integrity is a cornerstone of everything of what we do. And the final analysis will depend on how beneficial or detrimental what we do to our patients. Now, it has been topical recently, the issue of fabricated data. And I cited the editorial that was published in the European Journal by uh, Janish Gupta, uh, because it has some important le learning points. One, it is his assertion that up to 20% of published paper in the world literature are likely to fall into this fabricated fraudulent risk category. He did not indulge into just making that assertion. He gave us some indicator as to how and when we see the alarm bells ringing when we read a paper and gave us a helpful guiding score. So if you find that the trial not registered or you try, you try to play catch up for the publication and registered retrospectively, it really it should raise alarm and giving this alarm a score of three. If the number of authors is under three, particularly when you are doing a, a, a randomized clinical trial, and particularly where this is blinded and placebo controlled, you cannot do this kind of study as a single-handed person. And any, any person with two brain cells, once you see a single author or two author randomized control trial, you will feel that there is something wrong with this study. This has not been conducted to the research governance standard that it should be. If you finish your trial in June and you submit your publication in August, there is something wrong because cleaning the data and verifying the analysis and making sure everything is right take much longer. I can tell you that we finished the E3 study two years ago and the analysis is just nearing complete completion as we speak. Implausibility of recruitment numbers in the study time period. If you claim that you are study recruiting patients who have a certain abnormality that occur only in 5% of the population, you can't possibly recruit 800 patients within a year. And we in the UK struggle with this. For E-freeze in particular, we had to go back to the uh, 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 health and technology assessment um, organization to give us extension because the recruitment was not as fast as we expected. And eventually they had to cut the fund and we had to curtail the number of patients to recruit, accepting that we are, uh, uh, we will get the conclusion that will satisfy one aspect, but not every aspect of the study. Concern regarding following the consort. Most of you are um, familiar with how the consort flow chart work as to who were eligible and who was approached, who consented, who refused, who declined, who violated, who eventually was analyzable, uh, not, just best, uh, not just recruitable and per protocol and per intention to treat. And when there is some small extent uh, uh, of missing data, then it takes one. When check other trial from the same author, and institution during this trial period, then you need to ask question, was that center really having enough? Because there is always some clash when two studies are recruiting at the same time. So all of these, when you find that they are questionable, they raise a lot of alarm about the integrity. I give an example. I don't mean any person. I don't know the person who did the study, but look here. This is a study that was retracted. I have no idea who this author is. I have never met him, I don't, and I don't expect the uh, person to be um, uh, offended. I'm just using it as an example. Calcium versus oral contraceptive pills containing dosprenone for the treatment of mild to moderate premature, a double blind randomized control trial. I could only see a single author. And not surprisingly, it was retracted three years later. Then surely the intentions were great but the conduct must have suffered so much so that it was questionable and had to eventually. And these things do not require Sherlock Holmes. 
they only require common sense. But sadly, common sense, as I always say, is like deodorant. Those that need it most don't use it. And that is something to keep in mind. Now, some of us might cut corners and they indulge into feeling great because they are publishing like no tomorrow. And that is not dissimilar to this woman. Is this where you look at the mirror? Is that, do you see yourself pretty by just publishing anything, right or wrong, bad or ugly? This is just something to remember. You are forgiven to think I am being cynical, but I can always use this slide which says I'm not cynical. I have just been taking notes from history and that's what has been happening around us. Now, having finished with appraisal and knowing the good and the bad and the ugly, now comes the application. Evidence-based practice is a continuous process. What is the current state of affair could change. 10 years ago, we, everybody was doing endometrial scratching and there was a study to back it up. But when good studies have been conducted, it shows that really the enthusiasm was overwhelming and there is not a lot to it. So we can change how we do things because the evidence has become dynamic. So identify a clinical problem, search for evidence, make sense of the evidence that is appraisal, and then update the evidence when a new evidence appears, act on the evidence. And you need to store good evidence, discard poor evidence, rather than reciting studies that have already been overtaken by better evidence, which we see in the end. And I will never tire from using this slide. The most important critical thinking skill is being able to tell weak evidence from strong evidence. That's just, I can't overemphasize for any decent clinical practice that would like to help the patient, not anybody else, is critical thinking. I think with this, I gave my views and my opinion, and I look for uh, uh, further guidance from Khaled in his talk. Thank you. Thank you very much. for Thank you very much, Professor Khalaf, uh, a beautiful presentation as always. Uh, we have a few questions, but I, uh, I have the privilege of asking you one of these questions and then we'll leave the rest until the end. Uh, 
some people are asking, uh, is there, um, can we use statistical tests to check uh, if the data are fabricated? Is there a method for doing this? Yes, uh, I hope it doesn't come to that because if we don't do it, there will be no need to do that. There are some uh, uh, um, modeling that is being used um, called Monte Carlo uh, 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 modeling. It is not watertight, it's not 100%, but it can tell whether there has been an element of um, just number fiddling and making things even when they are not. Uh, but I hope we don't have to use it very often. Yeah. Okay. Thank you very much, Professor Yaqub. As I said, we'll uh, keep the rest of the questions until the end. But now it is my honor and pleasure to, profess, to introduce Professor Khan. As I said, uh, he's a world authority on uh, the subject. And it is my pleasure to introduce him. He'll be talking to us from beautiful Granada uh, and El Bayasin uh, district of this beautiful um, Andalusian city. Uh, Professor Khan. Uh, floor is yours. around the world. So I congratulate you on making uh, an impressive uh, campaign to advertise what we are discussing today. I also like very much the title chosen and I appreciate the excellent presentation by Professor Khalaf that sets the scene for uh, things I'm able to present now. I have also noticed some of the questions that have come, uh, come up in the chat. So I hope uh, those issues will be addressed as I present. Uh, in, in order to proceed with, uh, uh, with, with, uh, with the agenda, uh, I'll first let you have a little glimpse of my own life history. So you get an idea of where my ideas in the presentation come from. So I commenced medical school in 1983 in uh, Karachi in Pakistan. I then had the uh, opportunity to work in uh, Kenya. Um, I believe the, 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 the Lake Victoria from where River Nile begins that passes through your great country. Uh, has has the has the border uh, between some East African countries. I then returned to Pakistan to complete my fellowship in obstetrics and gynecology, and then I moved to uh, Canada, where I learned about research methods. And uh, from there, I moved to the UK, working in uh, various uh, uh, universities ultimately till this year when I have moved to Granada. Indeed, the time frame in Granada and Egypt is exactly the same. So 
it's a pleasure for me to be speaking to you from not that far away from your own location. Uh, this slide just shows uh, the 37 countries the opportunity to present ideas about how to undertake research that ultimately helps improve patient care. And it's been a privilege to be able to do that. Uh, but far more important than that is the orange line that I demonstrate in this slide. Uh, this is the number of patients who have taken part and have provided data, which are included in the papers I have published. So the most important thing from my point of view is not the number of papers or the, not the number of uh, cities that have invited me to talk about research, but it's the privilege I have had to be able to share the data contributed by patients in publications. And it is with these data that it is possible for us to make improvements uh, in our profession. With respect to my research, when in 1990, I returned to Pakistan from Kenya to commence my training in obstetrics and gynecology, I had the opportunity to publish my first paper. And this was nearly 30 years ago. And uh, 25 years ago is when I had the opportunity to publish my first systematic reviews. And through these uh, two and a half decades, I have had the opportunity also to be editor and author of various uh, journals and books. And at BJOG, I was chief editor for six years. Uh, of my 400 papers, uh, this is the list of citations. And uh, again, here I summarize the number of patients who have contributed data to my 150 systematic review projects. And here is an outline of uh, what I would like to cover. I'd like to tell you a little bit about the difference between knowledge and belief, building on the same theme that Professor Khalaf has highlighted. Then give a little bit of information about evidence-based medicine and then we'll move on to talk about the specifics of how research should be planned, how bias should be avoided, how outcomes should be put into effect sizes that are meaningful and measurable. And we'll cover some of those specific uh, issues that uh, have been raised in the chat so far. So to begin with, the knowledge that exists can be correct or incorrect. So if you think about the internet, it is a source of knowledge, a lot of people say. I would uh, object to that description. I would say it's a source of data. Whether that data has um, underpinnings for correct knowledge is developed by assessment of the data. And uh, the, the challenge here is that if we believe with confidence in certain knowledge, then that knowledge becomes usable. And when the knowledge is usable with it, we can make decisions. So if the knowledge is correct, we make well-informed decisions. On the other hand, if the knowledge is incorrect, for example, based on fabricated results in publications, then we could still possess that knowledge with confidence, that incorrect knowledge with confidence, and we could still use that incorrect knowledge for decision-making, but these will be misinformed decisions. And these decisions could harm the patients. Um, Ignorance is bad, but ignorance is mostly underpinned by lack of belief or confidence in the knowledge. Uh, but the most dangerous thing is to confidently believe in something as if it is right when it is actually not right. So 
Professor Khalaf uh, pointed this out uh, through his presentation. And uh, our objective as practitioners and as researchers should be to increase the size of this correct knowledge that we present in publications that clinicians believe in strongly. And then they are able to use this correct knowledge that they believe in strongly to the benefit of their patients. I'll give you some uh, examples from history. You see these two gentlemen. Uh, the one on the right hand side of your screen is associated with this hand full of germs. And we come to cover his story, but on the other side of the is Galileo, who for the first time, some 350 years ago, demonstrated that the center of, of, uh, of, uh, of our universe was the sun, not the earth. And the earth actually went around the sun. Uh, at that time, people believed that the earth was the center. And it took more than 350 years for the church to apologize formally for not accepting the facts Galileo presented uh, through his own investigations. So our idea is that we should challenge our beliefs with correctly presented knowledge underpinned by good research. And that's how we make progress caused by bad air. We did not know that uh, germs uh, existed and uh, he observed that in a labor ward run by midwives, the mortality was lower than in a labor ward run by doctors. And he also observed that the doctors attended to cadavers and between doing their dissection of dead bodies, uh, they attended also labor ward to assist women giving birth. And there was no process of hand washing because we did not know that germs caused infections. And with his knowledge, he introduced uh, a, a lime juice fluid to ask people to wash their hands, moving between cadavers and labor ward. And guess what? He observed that the mortality uh, came down. Today, this finding is the standard of hygiene. Uh, it should be the standard of hygiene in all health uh, care organizations. But at that time, his ideas were uh, not believed. And uh, he was uh, uh, consigned to a mental asylum where he subsequently died. Uh, but today, his name is celebrated through many commemorative stamps and coins. And uh, in the UK, the National Institute of Health recommends hand washing to prevent spread of infection. We, I think, are all aware of the importance of hand washing in the coronavirus uh, pandemic. Um, as I observe daily, it's being put to use. So what is the research journey? Well, we go through laboratory research. Uh, this type of research can also be called basic research. The objective of this research is to generate new information. Then we have research based on data collected from patient, patients um, in a clinical setting usually. And the objective of this type of research is to inform medical decisions. Uh, we can also call it applied research. So the journey from basic research to applied research is called research 
translation or the zone between the two is called translation zone and this is a long journey it affects clinical efficacy then effectiveness then it puts all the trials in through evidence synthesis or meta analysis into uh, what will ultimately be guidelines and then with these guidelines it's possible to inform practice and move forward so what types of studies are at various stages of this uh, translation well the initial studies are uh, called feasibility pilot studies these tend to be with small numbers of patients we then move into multi center large studies and then meta analysis and grading of evidence within meta analysis so if we think about the clinical process uh, and the knowledge requirements for each step in the process when a patient first presents to us they may have some underlying problem that we can evaluate through etiologic research then through tests history and examination we can make a diagnosis and for this our knowledge requirements are met through diagnostic research and then we give therapy with which we aim to change the outcome and this part of the clinical process is informed by prognostic or therapeutic research therapeutic research tends to be the only type that needs or involves or uses randomization the research can be primary research i.e. research that collects data directly from patients or it can be systematic reviews that collects data from published papers and the process of designing studies involves first outlining the question uh, the step 1 of evidence based medicine is exactly the same which is about asking questions and uh, as highlighted uh, there is conslos published uh, in uh, in in the medical literature and i highlight some of them for you stopping the study when achieving the desired result claiming to have the first or unexpected or uh, finding and then falsifying data so all of these things are things that uh, we should aim to avoid but they slip in to the published literature the challenge there as uh, has been mentioned earlier is that the reader should be able to make the difference between what is trustworthy and what is not cannot just rely on the editorial and peer review assessment process so rewording what has been uh, uh, eloquently described earlier combining the art with the science is what makes evidence based medicine possible and for the purpose of this presentation we can say that the knowledge and science is underpinned by the published papers in the medical journals so the e of evidence based medicine comes from the science we are able to read in journals and nowadays there is no need to look for them in your library in the form of a published uh, document that is physically uh, in the form of uh, a book or a journal but through the internet and on the screen of your computer mobile phone or ipad or or other such devices so these are the four steps we have looked at earlier we touch on the first step which is asking question in a bit more detail just now concerning this question in this image is the driver a man or a woman the question can be split into various components the drivers are the population or participants the in the i or the index test is the way they put petrol in the car the comparison is the other cars which have a standard pattern of driving after 
filling petrol and then how do you check the gender of the driver can be many different ways you can take a blood sample to check the chromosomes and what's the study design well it could be a cohort study where at the next traffic light we ask all the drivers to come out of the car take a blood sample and then we can check what their gender is which will determine the outcome so such a study a cohort study would normally involve a sample the sample is allocated to an intervention or a control control tends to be placebo but can also be standard care uh, no intervention and people are followed up in time to see whether they have the outcome present or absent with this the effect size is calculated time moves forward in this study and uh, this type of study is called a cohort study uh, another type of study where we start with the outcome again we use the term case to describe the outcome present but we use the term control to describe the outcome absent notice the use of the term control for describing outcome and compare this with the use of the term control for describing exposure in a cohort study this can cause confusion but to avoid the confusion the way to think about uh, this type of study is that in this study the time goes backwards and we discover whether the people with the outcome or with the out the outcome i e the control group has in the past had exposure or not and with this information we can also calculate an effect size by effect size here i mean something like an odds ratio so both cohort and case control studies give us the odds ratio the direction of travel in time is different and defining what is control in the case control study is related to the outcome whereas in a cohort study defining the word control is related to the exposure so i hope uh, this helps clarify the difference between a cohort and a case control study if you were confused or you saw this last control wrongly in the published literature so i wish to i wish to remind the audience that the responsibility for appraisal lies with you uh, the term case control in error can slip in the published literature uh, and uh, don't be fooled by it please assess the paper for yourself to see whether it is in fact a case control study here is another question example can coronavirus cause lymphoproliferative disorder participants are people at risk exposures are those with and without the disease confirmed by pcr or an, another test outcome is the disorder confirmed by histology or another test and the design could be follow up of people forward in time or selection of cases and controls and going back in history to see whether exposure occurred earlier or not you can think about a question in your own practice or setting in the same way so the elements of the question are frequently reported in the title and the title tends to be small here getting to the moon was just described in three words in published literature the title i recommend should be around the length of a tweet it should have certain other features but the most important thing is that it should be able to describe the study design so here the title says it's a meta analysis and it also describes in this one and the intervention you can see that design and intervention are components of the research question that we ask in the first step of evidence based medicine the outcome well here it's also included inside the term preterm labor another example 
you can see the design, the intervention, and the outcome. Another example, you can see the design, the intervention, and the outcome. So if you are in the first step of asking the lid, asking what is right for your situation, uh, what's the right evidence to address your curiosity or question, then title can give you strong clues as to whether the rest of the paper is worth reading for you or not. And the same information is repeated in the abstract. <coughs> the idea is that the authors should report the paper using the relevant guideline from the equator network. And the peer reviewers and editors should assess the paper using the same guidelines. The author should register the trial. Um, and then when systematic reviews are done, the systematic reviewers do the same, register the review and follow the Prisma checklist for, uh, for uh, writing up their papers. And uh, these papers tend to give information about the strength and weakness of the paper in the methods and results, but also in the abstract. But don't just rely on the abstract. You'll have to read the methods and results to be sure as to what act in fact was done and what was found. So are the results valid is a question that we address by reading methods and the results are the results. And we're gonna look at both of these in a second. The figures and table in a published paper help us a lot to figure out quickly for ourselves um, what the findings are. So here we look at a study, the same, same flow chart that we have seen before. It's important in a published study to look for the numbers reported in a flow diagram. Also the patients and data lost at every step. Um, nicely pointed out earlier that without data loss, you can start to wonder, did this study actually happen? Um, and here, let's say 100 people in each group were followed up and the intervention led to 25 pregnancies. And the control group or the standard care led to 10 pregnancies. Then how do we calculate the effect size? We're gonna look at that just now. So the information concerning outcomes goes at the top of a two by two table. The intervention and control information goes on the side of the two by two table. Uh, we put these numbers on the outcomes uh, here as shown on the slide. And from these data, uh, we can easily see how the total and the numbers of pregnancies enter into the two by two table. From this information, it's possible to calculate the risk or the proportion of people who achieve success. And here we can see that in the intervention group, 25% of people have the outcome. In the control, only 10% have the outcome. So the relative risk is 25 divided by 10, which is 2.5. So this is how the relative risk is calculated. And the odds ratio is not risk. It does not use the total, but it uses the using this information, we are able to calculate the odds for each group. And then we divide the odds of one group by the other. And when we divide the odds of one group by the other group, then we get the odds ratio. And you can note also that with the same data, it's possible to get two different effect sizes depending on what effect measure we use. In the discussion of a scientific paper, you will have a section under the strengths and weaknesses of the study. And here you should be able to see if the authors have honestly reported and if the peer reviewers and editors have asked them to do their job properly as to what are the good and the bad points 
concerning the strength of the paper. And from reading strengths and weaknesses, you can come to a conclusion as and the features necessary for assessing whether the findings are trustworthy are factors or quality features. And they relate to at least four things, selection bias, performance bias, measurement bias, and finally, attrition bias, which relates to completeness of data in the study. So selection bias relates to whether the groups are similar at baseline. Performance bias relates to whether the groups are similar with respect to the treatments given other than the interventions. So the co-interventions should be similar in the two groups. And the measurement bias relates to whether the outcomes are measured in the two groups in exactly the same way. So these four things allow you to assess how trustworthy the paper is and you should expect that in a paper well written and well assessed by journal editors, these items would be covered in the discussion section. Now we look at what is uh, the uncertainty around the effect estimate. So the odds ratio that we calculate will have an uncertainty around it depending on the size of the sample. And this is often represented by what we call the confidence interval. And here in a systematic review, you can see studies plotted according to their effect size. And around each point estimate of effect size is the confidence interval. If in this case, the outcome is pregnancy, there are less pregnancies achieved by intervention. <coughs> Excuse me. <clears throat> If there are less pregnancies achieved by intervention, then the point estimate of effect will be on the left-hand side of one. <clears throat> In this case, the confidence interval crosses the value one, so the p-value will not be significant. <clears throat> the outcome is pregnancy, so if the value, <clears throat> if more pregnancies are achieved with intervention, the value of relative risk or odds ratio will be more than one. And in this study, this point estimate highlights that there is a higher rate of pregnancy in the intervention group. <clears throat> if we put all this information into a software, a miracle occurs and we get what is called a diamond. This diamond is exactly the same as this blob and a line across it. The, the middle of the diamond represents the blob or the effect size that summarizes all of these things statistically. And this is a confidence interval, which summarizes and reflects the sample sizes of each of the study put together into a single analysis. Once this overall analysis has been done, we can perform sub-analyses of, for example, highest quality studies. And here you can see the diamond on average shows no effect. The low quality studies happen to show an effect. Therefore, on average, it looks like that the intervention may be achieving more pregnancies, whereas the reality is that the trustworthy studies do not show any effect at all. So we've got to be careful about trustworthiness or quality of study. Otherwise, we can be fooled into thinking that an intervention is effective. Here is vitamin C. Does it cause uh, males with infertility to improve the outcome for their uh, fertility problem? Well, here is a study that reports that uh, DNA fragmentation of the sperm is improved. But here, an outcome has been cherry picked. The real outcome of interest is pregnancy as highlighted by Professor Khalaf. So we cannot really reach a conclusion by this type of uh, study. Here's another study where uh, 
where there is a systematic review performed to examine male infertility. Um, here is uh, another study looking at uh, the systematic review, looking at the relationship between benzodiazepine exposure in pregnancy and uh, malformations and a cohort study design, which tends to be higher in quality than case control design, shows no relationship. Case control studies shows a relationship. We can unnecessarily develop a fear that this exposure may cause this problem when good quality literature shows no relationship. So the next step after collating all this data and assessing its quality is grading of the evidence. Uh, here I want to show you uh, the grading process, which looks at the design of the study, the imprecision of the results, the risk of bias, the inconsistency of finding between studies, and the directness of the outcome measured. And in this example, we can see two randomized trials have been summarized together. But you can see that even though the, the data come from randomized trial, because it has these other flaws, the quality of evidence is in fact graded in light of these flaws as low. So it's the fact that there is a randomized design used and it's called level A does not automatically convert this piece of information into something that is trustworthy and useful for informed decision making. So with this, I'd like to summarize that uh, systematic reviews allow reviewers to evaluate the primary studies for their value. And through this type of detective work, they are able to discriminate between truths and half-truths. And by creating this order out of chaos can allow for research to be taken forward for informing practice. The duty we have as practitioners is to help resolve uncertainties about the effects of treatments. I'll give you an example here of uh, breast cancer mortality after the second world war. Every decade, the problem was getting worse. At the same time, research was going on. And by the time around 30,000 women were randomized into trials, only after that, the mortality started to come down. So research is not just for the sake of adding two lines to your CV. It is to make a difference to the outcome of patients for whom our profession exists. So research is important, not just because in the future it will help people once the studies are finished and published, but the question also arises whether it helps people who take part in research. So here is a flow diagram of the life cycle of research going from clinical problem all the way to incorporation in practice and along the way uh, we have uh, participation of patients in studies. And it's also possible for patients to help inform the importance of the question or prioritization of the question. Also inform how the design of the study should be planned. Patients can in fact also be co-investigators with us in planning our research in addition to being participants in research. So if you imagine two organizations, uh, in one there is people being actively encouraged to take part in research. And in another, they are being given the treatment preferred by practitioners, not necessarily being invited to take part in research. What will be the difference in effect? Well, do you think that the patients will receive more frequent personal monitoring if they were in the study where they were taking part in research or in the 
other group where they are not taking part in research. Well, I'd like to imagine as a researcher that research creates the infrastructure within which follow-up can be, can be better organized compared to standard care. Will the care be according to a protocol? Far more likely that this is the case in a research study where there are people keeping an eye on patients who are going through the process of taking part in a study compared to another situation where the same kind of patient does not have an opportunity to take part in a study. Do clinicians who take part in research have better understanding, better, well, I don't know. I'll, I'll, I'll leave that for you to think whether these clinicians and providers are better than those of an improved outcome to patients than those who are not taking part in research. And uh, we're going to address this question by looking at this uh, meta-analysis that evaluates whether health outcomes are better for those who are research participants. So here is a meta-analysis of studies where uh, the outcome is in, reported in such a way that a value less than one favors participation in research and value higher than one favors non-participation. And here you can see that when a meta-analysis is carried out, the outcomes are approximately 25% better for those who take part in research. And these are studies all related to women's health. In this study, we can see there is an effect, but the confidence interval crosses one, so it's not statistically significant. In this other one, the effect is against the intervention, which is taking part in research. And in another study, the effect is very much in favor of uh, better outcomes amongst those who take part in research. And when all of this is put together on average, the benefit is around 25%. So on this basis, uh, in several publications, uh, we've recommended that clinicians take an interest and actively uh, educate themselves and empower their teams to become investigators who take part in multi-center studies. And uh, when patients and the health service have the support of this, these types of teams, uh, with uh, academic departments cooperating with trials units. And I'm very glad to announce that uh, Dr. Fauzi, the organizer of uh, this webinar, is uh, in the process of setting up a clinical trials unit uh, in Upper Egypt. And I hope he'll have a chance to say a few words about it once I stop talking. Um, and when these units cooperate with research programs, ethics committees in clinical networks and work closely with industry and impart this training to the juniors, then we create a culture in which patients and public can engage in research. And uh, year after year, more patients take part in studies and through this process, we are able to create knowledge that will eventually permeate into practice. And to summarize, it is an ethical requirement on us as practitioners to reduce uncertainty about effects of interventions, to take part in research. And it's through research that our profession and it's standing and the outcome for our patients will improve. And uh, we should measure engagement in research and use it as a quality measure for organizations uh, that deliver healthcare. And to end, I present to you my initiative called Health Education Research on the social media platform where uh, 
I encourage you to uh, post your comments, ask me questions, and make suggestions for how we can make research better in our practice and improve the outcome for our patients. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Professor Khan, for a great lecture, as uh, always. Uh, we have uh, plenty of questions, but we will have, we try to, to, uh, to do them all in the, uh, in the interest of time. And uh, the first question is for your good self. Uh, and it goes like this. Uh, 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 there are three sequential publications in human production and also in others and other journals recommending the use of relative risk and not odds ratio for women's health studies. But, uh, so statisticians like the odd ratio, what methodologists like the relative risk, what do you think would be the best? So, uh, look, the, the first most important thing is that the data collected should be trustworthy. Then what you do with it is the next step. And that's where odds ratio or relative risk comes in. Uh, the most important thing to remember is that the relative risk cannot be generated from case control studies. Sorry, that's correct. And the odds ratio can be generated from case control studies. So that's the basic, um, th that's the basic understanding that is necessary. Now, the relative risk is perhaps more intuitive, but 
it's even more simple than that. You can simply say, what is the rate of the pregnancies? And communicating with patients. So I am not a big fan of going into a debate over whether relative risk is better than odds ratio. I'm more a fan of simplifying even further when, which allows for easy communication yeah. with patients. All right, another question. Do we need to rely on the p-value only or should we ignore the p-value and look into the precision of the confidence interval? And I think- I, I'm sorry, I think I, I, I got cut off, but I'm back in touch uh, uh, yeah. again. Can you hear me? Uh, yes, we, you went uh, off uh, for a second, yes. Uh, um, uh, and uh, can we rely on, uh, on, on the p-value only or should we look for confidence interval? Well, p-value serves an important function in, in, uh, in, in, in understanding the results obtained. But, Certainly, it's not something that's the only factor we should rely on. Uh, it's a, it, the main problem with the p-value is that when the sample size is large, the chance of finding a significant p-value is much higher. Yeah. Uh, okay. So, on the yeah. one hand, large sample is a friend, but it can also be an enemy. Yeah. Okay. There is another question, I think it's for Professor Yacoub. Uh, how can we reach a conclusion on whether a paper uh, uh, read is valid uh, or should be ignored? Uh, I, think, uh, I think- I think I covered some of that in the talk, but- um, Simple formula for the general reader. This is how the question goes. Yes, if you, yes, if you feel that some, particularly for intervention, Interventions are where people are inclined to be so enthusiastic and they make it sound too good to be true. So if people are so enthusiastic and you find that an intervention that does not have biological plausibility is proving to double the pregnancy rate, ignore it. And I take responsibility because just biology does not allow for that. If the trial is published in a very marginal journal that does not have good review process, ignore it. If a claim is being made that we have multi-center randomized control trial in a place or a country where research governance is rudimentary, ignore it. If you have a study that is claimed to have been done by single or two investigator that normally would cost two million pounds, ignore it. So the, the, there are so many factors where you can tell if it walks like a duck, talks like a duck, it must be a duck. Hmm. Yeah. How, how would you tell this to the Cochrane collaboration? I have been telling them this over two days because the Cochrane review are victim of their good intentions. They yeah. assume that every randomized control study reported is being done honestly. And that is not an assumption at uh, celebrating the 25th anniversary of the Cochrane collaboration in gynecology and infertility a few years back in Oxford. We spent two days debating that. And at the end, it became apparent. They did a very interesting exercise. They picked 10 randomized control trial and they contacted the investigators. And they asked them, can you describe to us how did you do your allocation concealment? How did you go about blinding? And the answers were laughable. There was no even notion of how these things are done. So now I am taking still this up with Cindy Farquhar, who is absolutely great person to try to get them to reach a politically correct formula where studies that fulfill certain criteria should not be included in the Cochrane review. And one criteria that I will insist on, and I hope I get my way, if the trial does not have access to the raw data to submit to the Cochrane collaboration, it should never be included. Then we will get a reliable evidence. Otherwise, 
we end up with hard work being undermined by work of the people who cheat and fabricate. I think this is a very good uh, idea. I mean, uh, okay, but, uh, but so that we don't uh, embarrass uh, the, the, the questionable people and at the same time, exactly. you, you help humanity to no, get... You know, yes, you know what? If we, st if we tighten the research governance, we are protecting the investigators and protecting patients and protecting the credibility of our field. So these are three main objectives. Because if the investigator, we all worked in environment where there was no research governance, and we worked under, we have the E-freeze, I said it was going for eight years. Yesterday or two days ago, they were chasing me for a serious adverse incident that I did not sign because one of the babies born on the frozen arm has a tongue tie which is so minor, but it has to be reported. Otherwise, the study will not be having the veracity and the credibility that it requires. Exactly. Thank you very um, much. May I, may, may, may I make some additional comment? Please, yes. please, Professor Khan. So, uh, uh, what Professor Khalaf just Your internet is unstable. Can I say again, please, Professor Khan? Start from the beginning because your internet is unstable. It is really, really, really important. Necessary for each year for ensuring the integrity of data collected and research. So, I, uh, uh, so I, I am once again wanting to highlight in this uh, forum that in Upper Egypt, such a network is being created. Yes. It will allow people the opportunity to benefit from the robust methods being applied to ensure data integrity, as well as data monitoring. Yes. And I would encourage colleagues who are uh, listening to take this message out to others who are not able to attend that they seek and support such an initiative across Egypt. Yes, sir. Yes. yes sir. To, add, to add to... Please go ahead. Yes. Uh, to add to what Khalid said, that uh, I have first-hand experience of Mohammed and his colleagues have a very admirable reaction to the cloud of accusation of Egyptian research in reproductive medicine at least. They did not take it the way of jumping up and down and talking out of emotions and pride because credibility is earned, is not granted. So they said, how can we address the issue of credibility? And we agreed a few things. If we facilitate credible multi-center trials, A, it will allow the researcher to contribute, to get their authorship that they require credibly and deservedly, it will provide the research governance where there is data and ethics and uh, monitoring committee. There is a steering committee, people who can keep an eye on the recruitment, on the veracity, on the methodology. We also agreed that if we could have an electronic data capture platform that can be accessed online, it will facilitate access by different center so even if you recruit 10 from your center under the same protocol and put the data in a way that is auditable. So if you had the urge to massage the figure, you will be found out because the system will say on that day you changed nine and made it 19. If and when this great project materialized, I think it will be a very good addition and I would welcome the contribution of the joint researcher and their institution and we hope that will be emulated and this network of collaboration will be there. Mohammed went even further. He wanted the quality control to be internally. People don't know that this um, simulator that I mentioned in answering one question, Monte Carlo simulation, I have, have first-hand experience that Mohammed is now resident expert. If you have a study, you wanted to run it by the Monte Carlo simulator to know whether the figures add up or not, send it to Mohammed. He will send you the report in no time. Sorry, yes. Mohammed, you, you will get more work. So collectively, there is a very fresh and refreshing response 
not reaction to the accusation leveled at some corners uh, of um, the reproductive medicine research that is published from Egypt. Yes, I want to just to add that uh, the uh, representative committee of the college has expressed is uh, its uh, its support of uh, uh, everything you have said and that integrity is paramount. And also the Egyptian Society for Reproductive uh, for Fertility, yes, if yes. I may. Yes. Okay, there is a question for Professor Khan. Can a simple post hoc calculation of the power by, a read, by the reader justify a study conclusion if it was sufficient? Or should we consider the study effect size in the post hoc power calculation, or do we need to consider the effect size published in other trusted studies? Okay, so look, first thing I need to say is that whatever I say here is based on my own idiosyncrasy. It's not necessary what I say will be the same as what you will read in textbooks. So please just keep that in mind. Yes. The sure. issue of statistical power is important when we start the study. When the study is finished and it is being published, the issue of statistical power is not at all important because what can you change now? Correct. Correct. The only thing you can do is look at what is the width of the confidence interval. So I would encourage to use the energy and enthusiasm with respect to sample size at the time of planning a study, at the time of recruiting patients, so we meet our sample size. But when it comes to reading a paper, it's better to focus on its confidence interval because the confidence interval gives the range of the possible results around the main observed result given the sample size. So this is my summary and I'm sorry if it does not directly address the question. Yeah, but thank you very much. Uh, another question for Professor Khalaf. Can trials powered by for multiple primary endpoints be more beneficial and less, less time consuming than those powered for one primary outcome at a time? I think those will be much easier said than done, reliably. A primary objective and one objective is the orthodox way of doing research. I... Secondary outcome measure <laughs> should, be seen, should be seen as a research hypothesis generated. They can be followed up on their own rise. But to, you cannot exclude possibilities you haven't considered. So you need to focus on the primary objective that is of matter. You know what? Whenever we design a research study, there must be patient representative contribution. And the main objective of patient representative contribution is to ask them, what is the outcome that matters to the patient? You can get excited about this agent and that agent and that fertilization and the patient would like to have a baby. That's all. Hmm. Okay, another question, I think for a question for uh, Professor Khan. Uh, um, uh, how uh, do we do sample size in an observation study? How to see the sample size given in observation study, if it's adequate or not? So I, I mean, how to... Uh, evaluate it in an observation study. Uh, Professor Khan, I think uh, his uh, internet is unstable. Maybe Professor, uh, Professor Khan, did you get the, the question? I, I, I apologize, my connection is not the best. No, no, it's all right. It's but, all right. Uh, I think the gist of the question is in an observational study, how should we calculate the sample size? Yeah, yeah. Okay, well, look, there is, the first thing about sample size is it is only an estimation. It's based usually on guesswork. So please don't think of sample size as something uh, set in stone. It's an idea that can be worked at in many different ways, not just one way. So in observational studies where our objective is to create a statistical model for analysis, usually for predicting an outcome or adjusting the effect of an intervention for its relationship with the outcome, the model will include several variables. 
So the sample size in this type of analysis plan depends on the number of variables to be included in the model. So for each variable included in the model, it's suggested that there should be at least five to 10 outcomes. So if we are constructing, uh, if we are planning a statistical, if we are planning an observational study, which will analyze the data using 10 uh, variables in the model. And uh, uh, this means that if there are 10 outcomes per variable, then there should be 100 outcomes. And if the prevalence of the outcome is 10%, then we are talking of a very large sample size. Yeah. But if we are talking about prevalence of 20, 30%, we are talking at a smaller sample size. So the concept applied to what is going to be done with the data is what should drive the calculation of sample size. Yes, sir. Okay. Can irreproducibility of summary statistics be an alarming sign for data integrity? I think again, uh, it's for you. May you repeat the question one more time? So I apologize. The irreproducibility of summary statistics. Can it be an alarming sign for data integrity? So my thinking, uh, I'll appreciate comments from Professor Khalaf as well. My thinking is that judging data integrity from results is something if we can avoid by setting up systems that avoid problems with integrity is a far better approach. Would you, would you second that, Professor? I, I definitely do. I'm all for prevention because people don't set out to cheat. Sometimes it is out of lack of clarity. It is out lack of resources. They get desperate. And it is mostly related to methodology and knowledge rather than intentionally going to cheat. And as such, they should be supported to improve the methodology, give them more opportunities to join forces, then it does not become an unwieldy task for an individual. Uh, okay, but can I uh, ask a question myself here, please? Um, the publication bias, if we can call it, because journals are, are tend to publish things with statistical significance. So people do the research and then they don't find statistical significance and they think, uh, then they are tempted to do uh, some changes or uh, remove the outliers and so on. So our how can we um, uh, let journals publish uh, uh, studies with non-statistical significance? Is there something? Well, uh, can, can I make a comment about this? Please. So I think uh, it's important to understand that the whole system has some strange motivations. Yeah. Yeah. So ideally, the journal should publish what is ethically approved and registered, regardless of what the result is. But because the journals are themselves in some kind of a financial competition about winning the race against other journals, they prioritize positive findings. And guess what? Even in the coronavirus, New England Journal has had to retract some papers, right? Yeah. So forget about other problems. Here we are dealing with a hot potato and the whole system. I mean, this is a question not just of researcher integrity. It's also about system um, deviation from the main purpose. Yeah, yeah. But I think my observation, uh, Professor Salam, that um, good and high profile journals will be more likely to publish credible uh, research with negative result than other journals. I give you an example. In like two, three years, we published three multi-center randomized control trials. One in the Lancet for the HAP Select, showing no benefit from PIXI. And two in New England Journal of Medicine, one about progesterone and recurrent miscarriage, and one, the other one about endometrial scratching, both showing that the intervention does not add value for the majority of patients. Yeah. So yeah. The, the good journals will always go for the clinical issue yeah. and, and the way to address it. But unfortunately, the other area that we have not touched on, the peer review process. 
is extremely crucial because sometimes the editor will be relying on, or most of the time will be relying on the peer review process and people may treat it with contempt even because for some of these papers that turn out to be retracted, they have gone through the peer review process yeah. and the person was not discerning enough and allowed something that smelt a rat to go through. Sure. Sure. Okay, there is a question. I think it comes from uh, Dr. Mohamed Fauzi. Can a weighted sensitivity analysis of large observational studies upgrade its level to causation? Such methods have been suggested to, to be used. I think for, uh, for our Professor Khan. So, well, it's a question from somebody who actually knows a lot about what he's asking. <laughs> Yeah. So it may be good if he could explain the question a bit more. Uh, it, that would help me understand. Yeah. Uh, if, uh, uh, for 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 large or large observational study, there is some claims that if we could uh, do uh, some weighing score matching for this for this study to make the two group are comparing it to oh, the randomized okay. group, this could upgrade the association to causation. This mm -hmm. is valid valid conclusion or not? Okay, so I think you're talking about what's called in the language I have read, propensity score analysis. Yes, of course. Yeah, yeah. So this is uh, for others in the audience who don't know about this approach. If you think about it, we use randomization to create groups that are similar at baseline. And in observational studies, we do not have randomization. So groups could be different at baseline. But if we could use techniques like propensity score analysis that could help adjust for these differences in a smart way. But remember propensity score analysis can only be done with things we have measured. Randomization has the beauty that it creates balance between groups for things we have not measured or we do not know. So no matter how smart we are with statistics in creating balance between groups, we are unable to do anything about unmeasured or unknown confounding. So this is the only proviso I would place uh, uh, Dr. Fauzi about uh, the comment you have raised for our consideration and in this forum. Uh, another question from Jehan Mustafa. Can I use odds ratio as a way to present the strengths of association between risk factors, exposures, and outcomes? Well, yes, odds ratio is the most frequently used way to present the strength of association. It can also be presented with relative risk, but let's just stay with odds ratio. And uh, values greater than five or 10, I think would be considered as a very strong association. I think values closer to one, less than two, will probably be considered weak association. Yes. Uh, internet uh, is, uh, connection is unstable, I guess. Associations. But these example we heard from Professor Khalaf earlier that he believes based on, based on biology, that to expect to have effect size is greater than two will be unrealistic. So when we think about strength of association, we should also think about biological plausibility. Uh, so in addition to strength of association, there are several other factors to be considered when we are evaluating causation. Yes, sir. I think that yeah. is an important issue, unfortunately, that people get confused with. They mix association for causation very frequently. And at every level, you will find the systematic review saying uh, increased DNA fragmentation cause miscarriage. There are certain criteria well published like since 1975 or something about the cause effect relationship and how it's established. It is not by the way and the method claim. Association can be misleading. There is a website for funny and strange association, which links increased rate of sunburns to eating ice cream, not knowing that both happens during summer and the relationship stops there. 
So this bit of association and causation, unfortunately, can be misleading, and um, usually people are misled by it. Association is not causation. Yeah. Okay. Um, I don't know if you should go one step uh, back. Adwa uh, Khuderi, she says, I know my question is very basic, but how about can we rely on odds ratio or relative risk, or are they similar? Uh, I don't know if we need to answer this question. Uh, I, I look, I would just emphasize one more time that uh, <clears throat> um, that the data are the real thing. Yes. From the data can emerge any form of calculation. Uh, but beware that with the same data, like I showed in my presentation, the relative risk calculation was 2.5, whereas odds ratio was three. So odds ratio can give a false impression of a higher level of association by giving a bigger number. So please stay focused on what are the rates in the groups? And then let's not, now I'm talking more as more for readers and users of evidence for people who write these stuff for journals. Clearly you have to think about what is the statistical significance, what statistical model to use, uh, et cetera. I think the current day statistical softwares allow you to use modeling or other sophisticated Yes, sir. Okay. Uh, I think this uh, question goes to uh, Professor Keller. Did analysis both with odds ratio and relative risk would encourage more judicious interpretation as being. Okay. Another question for uh, Professor Khalaf. It comes from uh, Dr. Ahmed Adaman, the uh, PGD expert. I think we all know him. Thank you for your valuable uh, lectures, Professor. Um, uh, what do we do with research mistakes? For example, we miss to register a clinical trial before we start. We miss some patient's data. We did not read the sample size due to fund cut. So what should we do? This is uh, his question to Professor Khalab, and there is his question also to Professor Khan, how to improve our research skills. Oh, that's... Uh, that's a, a whole uh, such, but uh, let's stick with Professor uh, Khaled. Yeah. Yeah. The, the, the question about um, the um, sample size and about having few loss to follow up or missing data, that is inherent part of research. As long as you have it in your head that you will do your best and you will have a system to capture as much of the data as it is practically possible, and you will acknowledge it in the literature. And when you write your discussion, you will acknowledge it in perspective. If it's too much, you have to own up. If it is too little, you have to just uh, uh, um, um, explain too and, and get moving. In terms of registration, really people, they live in the planet that we live in. And clinicaltrial.gov is available and has been available for years. There is no excuse for afterthoughts because afterthoughts come back to haunt us and you will be amazed at the highest possible level. There is a very publicized group that published like No Tomorrow. They just published a study recently where in the clinicaltrial.gov, they set out two arm study. When it appeared in fertility sterility, it was five arm study. Who do you believe? So there must be checks and balance. I've always had my doubts about retrospective registration. That is after thought and you are playing catch up and it should be seen as such. Okay, another question. Uh, please, may, may I, please. I, I, I'm really sorry, but I am going to have to beg leave soon. So I would like to thank everybody for listening to me and to Dr. Fauzi for the invitation and for your moderation. Thank you very much, I Professor. I am, if there is one last question, I'll be happy to take that. Uh, I'll, I'll right. like to uh, take I think, again, it comes from, uh, from Mohamed Fauzi. Jack Wilkinson's group of Manchester disregard much of the published randomized control trials in reproductive medicine based on the opinion of a lack of power. And they recommend 90% power 
should be the minimum. This disagree with your opinion, Dr. Khan. What do you think? Because uh, may, I, may I add something here? I mean, in all our research, there are plenty, we, we compare stimulation protocols with another stimulation protocols. Are these all patients, do they have the same embryo transfer technique? Do they have the same embryometrium sensitivity? Do they have the same luteal phase support? There are plenty of, uh, do, do they have the same laboratory uh, uh, conditions? There are plenty of factors there. And I, so, uh, look, uh, I, so if you think about statistical power, Usually it is calculated for one main outcome measure and one question per study. Uh, I think it's a good idea for us to extend the power to 90% because it will increase also the power for secondary analysis that we can perform within that study. And I think it's not a bad idea to, to look at the power of secondary hypotheses inside the inside a study in addition to the primary when planning. So once, once we have reached a stage where we're going to set up a proper study and if we can recruit a few more patients within ethical bounds and increase power for secondary analysis, then that can only be a good thing. Yeah. All right, thank you very much, Professor Khan. I think we, we are 11 o'clock now. We'll, uh, if you are, have uh, to leave, we want to thank you very much and I hope we will have the, the, the pleasure of welcoming you uh, in Egypt, in Alexandria, the north part of Egypt, and in Upper Egypt also. I've spotted the Rioja, the Rioja so maybe we will, uh, we will have to uh, sample this together sometime. In, uh, in I, the I, sh I, I, I should also highlight that University of Granada has a bilateral agreement with University in Alexandria. So okay. we should take up that uh, existing relationship to build on it. Of course we will. Oh, sorry, uh, sorry, Jakub. Sorry, we'll uh, we'll build on that. Okay yeah. then. So we'll leave you to uh, to enjoy the rest of your uh, your night or to uh, do uh, some more work, and we'll uh, we'll have the privilege of Professor Jakub for two or three more lectures before we. Uh, we All right. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Thank Thank you very much Professor Khan. Bye bye. Okay. Bye bye. Cultures results and also microscope result is is it acceptable? I don't really get this, the the question. And the secondary outcome will be as, same. As a principle, as a principle, having more than one primary outcome is not favored. Yeah. As a principle, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Um, the issue that was raised about how many variables to look after. Really, if you are doing proper randomization, it should take care of. The, the, and, and if you feel there is a factor that's so important, you can do something called minimization, where within the randomization, there will be block randomization. You, and you put H within the group, you put FSH, you put AMH within the group, so it becomes as homogeneous as is possible from early setting of the trial. And electronic data capture can easily do these things. Yeah. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Professor. Uh, Hey, uh, uh, let me uh, ask you, I think uh, uh, there are plenty of questions. Maybe we can answer them after that uh, by, uh, by, by on, on, uh, on, on web line. Some, uh, and for, Mah for Professor Mohammed Fauzi, uh, people are asking for a certificate. Are they going to get a certificate or not? Yes. yes. They are going to get a certificate. Okay. So they will uh, contact the, uh, the responsible person. And uh, Professor Khaled, let me ask, we have touched on uh, uh, randomized studies, but of course, evidence-based medicine is not only to evaluate randomized studies. For of, course, of course. There is the evaluation of a prognostic test. Definitely. There is the evaluation, yeah, the economical evaluation. There is the, uh, the evaluation of the, uh, the, what uh, our uh, colleagues in oncology do, the five years yes. uh, analysis. And just I wanted you maybe, you want to tell people something about this, that we have only touched on one aspect of evidence-based medicine. Uh, I, th I think it's important that most of the uh, 
of the confusion comes from interventions. We get excited about intervention. Antagonist is better than agonist or vice versa. Uh, X is better than IVF. Uh, embryo transfer day three, day five. The only way to assess an intervention objectively is randomized control trial. But yeah. if we talk about safety of IVF, you cannot have a randomized control trial meaningful for over an hour simulation, particularly in this day and age, really, because it's getting exceedingly rare. And in order to make a study, you need 30,000. But more importantly, if you wanted to address the congenital birth defect, something like 3%, you cannot get that from randomized control trial. It has to be a prospective follow-up, and even from databases, from large number, you're talking about thousand. So definitely is the case. The only bit that people make serial mistakes is to give too much credibility to retrospective studies. Retrospective studies are synonymous to bias. Selection bias, reporting bias, inference bias, everything. And it does happen where people get enthusiastic about intervention and say, oh, I notice in my patients, when I do this, they are getting pregnant. That does mean nothing without subjecting them to a real test. Or I look back and I selected those patients, but you don't know, and you cannot achieve the similarity in comparison retrospectively. Even when you do a case control, it will be selection by convenience, not selection by objectivity. So these studies are good to generate hypotheses, but they are not good to establish effectiveness or otherwise. But there is no question, observational studies and case control studies for areas where the exposure need to be so wide because the impact is so little. You need large, large sample size that you can only obtain from this kind of uh, cohort studies. Look at them. Dr. Hassan. Dr. Hassan. تعبناك معانا عارفين احنا. Work unstable عند دكتور حسن. ها؟ اه. It work unstability عند دكتور حسن. لو في أي سؤال عندك يا محمد للناس من الناس يعني كده بتاع ممكن نجاوبه لما الدكتور حسن يبقى يجوين أس يعني. في سؤال بيقول what is the best place to start research in this area? The best place to start research is really to have genuine will to do proper research. And where there is a will, there is a way. And you don't have to start by trying to do groundbreaking stuff. You start by simple stuff, at least to provide the infrastructure, to provide the culture for research. Without culture, no strategy will succeed. If the strategy is believed in the investment in research in terms of time, and to some extent money, then everything will follow. If you believe that research has to be credible and need to be done according to the foundations of proper research conduct, then you will collaborate with like-minded, trustworthy people who have integrity and they will not cut corners. You cannot do research on the side. I have great concern, people might not like it, about research coming from private clinics. Don't tell me in your private clinic you have time to look after the patient rather than to recruit for them for research properly. These are things I, I should be challenged and I'm happy to be challenged, but I don't. It only exists in private establishment where there is a team and infrastructure to support research. But to claim that you have recruited 8,000 patients from your clinic, I'm sorry, I don't buy it. And I'm not targeting anyone or any person. We need to be realistic and to need to invest in collaboration and meaningful collaboration rather than claim that we can do it single-handedly because it will always get us into hot water. Uh, uh, there is another question from uh, Dr. Khal Rautifi. Uh, what, yeah. is way of, uh, what is the way of clinical experience and the clinical sense in the era of evidence-based medicine? Our clinical sense will always be there in order to um, perhaps focus on what matters and what does it when you speak to patient. But it does not replace, it does not come near replacing good, solid, robust, objective evidence. Uh, yeah, okay, thank you very much, Professor Yaqub. I think um, uh, um, the uh, 
the, the, the session is beautiful, the webinar is beautiful, but I, we cannot go forever. So I'll just ask Professor uh, Mohamed Fauzi to tell us something about uh, the project, and then we will thank you again and, uh, and uh, end up the, uh, the webinar. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, when we discussed the issue of data integrity with Professor Yaqub, uh, what should we need here to uh, to upgrade the entire level of our studies in Egypt to be uh, at its cutting edge? The first and uh, the most important point, uh, 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 my professor said, Mohammed, we need to establish a data capturing platform that can be always uh, uh, can be always accessible from the data monitoring committee and every change uh, done through, uh, throughout the study can be tracked by the data monitoring committee and uh, from that point we uh, make some uh, discussion uh, to uh, to uh, interact with some with some companies uh, like Metrinet in Europe, and they uh, they uh, they have uh, they need a very huge amount of money to provide this service to us. And after that, we have discussed with uh, some other friends, uh, 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 two programmers in Argentina and uh, one professor of biostatistics in Madrid, and also. Professor Khalid Khan uh, to create this project uh, our, uh, by, our, by, 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 by the Egyptian, uh, by those programmers in Argentina who created the, uh, the data capturing platform for the RCT done by the WHO in the last 10 years. So they have the experience needed to uh, create that. And uh, we are in the process of creating this, which will be independently uh, Running, running a project. We will not. We, 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 as a persons, will will have no access to it. But just we, we are. We, as we are, as as a researcher, we will, uh, we will use it to the to, uh, to, to, to will apply for our uh, RCT. But this for but 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 for uh, it will be independently uh, working uh, by programmers from uh, Argentina and others from uh, Spain and uh, data monitoring committee specified for every trials from uh, Egypt, from Alexandria, from Cairo, from uh, UK. And Dr. Yaqub can add more about this project uh, because he is he suggested the idea and told me that the most important investment to be done is to do this. Yeah. Please, Professor Yaqub. Yes, I think, I think now there's a call for submitting grow data will increase. Why? Because there is something new called individual patient data meta-analysis, which A, ensure veracity and integrity of data, B, try to pull things together in a homogeneous way. And it is taken, if you, if you really refuse or you can't provide the raw data for this kind of exercise, it will be considered as a sign that A, you have not taken this seriously and what you presented lacks roots and it is fair. Yes, people need to go about it in a decent and friendly way, not a very arrogant and condescending way, but the scientific community is able to uh, tackle this bad approach. Thank you very much, Professor Yacoub. I think this is a, a, um, a beautiful ending for this webinar. I will want to thank uh, Professor uh, Yacoub for all his efforts and uh, all his uh, time for sharing his great knowledge and vast experience with us and also Dr. Professor Khaled Khan. And uh, I would like to thank uh, Dr. Mohammed Fauzi and the group in uh, the Upper Egypt um, uh, Assisted Production Society for all their efforts and for inviting me to be a moderator tonight. And uh, mm -hmm. thank you all. And uh, as we say in French, à la prochaine, until the next uh, meeting. Uh, uh, thank you very much and see you again. Au revoir. Au revoir. Au revoir. Au revoir.